Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Inside College Soccer. Uh, today's guest is uh, a guy that I started following. I guess I found him when I when I jumped on Twitter in like 2019. And I just kind of started following him and I said, oh, yeah, this has to be Tony's kid. So I started following him and then I reached out and we've kind of interacted a little bit. But today we've got Anthony DeChico. How are you, man? Doing well done. Thanks for having me on. Right on. I just thought we'd have a conversation here, man. I, I know a little of your story. Your dad was like 15 years older than me and I was trying to coach and I was following what the top coaches were doing and, and paying attention and the Chico method and camps would come up in magazines and books. And so, you know, a lot of us in the country that looked up to your dad, but I was really curious what it was like to grow up in a household where I imagined a lot of soccer talk and uh, because it was a job for dad, right? So when, uh, when were it you- was his, It was his passion. I mean, certainly it was, it was work and there was times that, that it, right. uh, it was challenging to navigate, but, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that everybody gets to say, you know, if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. But I do believe that, he, that he's in that minority that, uh, that got to walk that path. So yeah, soccer was, was part of our daily existence. Yeah, that, that's cool. And then those days, so you were born in what year? Because you've got, what, there's four, four kids in the family? Yep, there are four, four boys. Uh, I'm the oldest of the four. And so uh, I was born in 1982, uh, the same year that uh, dad started Soccer Plus Goalkeeper School, which was the camp that you were referring to. Uh, and and uh, they opened the retail store in Connecticut. Um and so we grew up in Connecticut, uh, just outside of Hartford. Uh, by the time I was around, Dad's uh, professional career was uh, was over, but his coaching career was was just getting started. And uh, you know, I think the thing that that it's easy for us to forget, you know, in 2023, is just how different the landscape of soccer looked in the 80s and 90s and in the U.S. and uh, so the good, the bad, and the ugly, I had a front row seat to, to all of it. Um, of the four boys in our family, uh, two of them, uh, not myself, but uh, my youngest brother and, and uh, the, the second oldest uh, played college soccer. Um, the third one was probably the best athlete of the four of us and just opted to, to take a different route. And uh, when I finished high school, my first step uh, was to go to work in the WSA for the Washington freedom in that, in that first league. Um, so we all have different, different paths, different journeys through the game, but it was always uh, certainly, uh, you know, part of a part of our, um, our story. So what are your first like soccer memories of uh, where you realized that this was more than just uh, more than just a, a game? Did I lose you, Don? Yeah. Oh, sorry. What What are your first soccer memories uh, growing up in the household when you realized this was more than just a game? It was part of the lifestyle of the family. What, when did you realize that? Yeah, yeah. Well, probably, uh, you know, that was probably camps, um, you know, soccer plus goalkeeper school in the, in the 80s was a really uh, unique experience because in the same way soccer was different here, it was different, it was different in Europe uh, as well. Um, so we had uh, professional players, international goalkeepers, uh, former World Cup champion Peter Benetti, who used to come over and spend the summer with us um, doing goalkeeper camps. And, you know, as I became old enough to, you know, to understand that this is before the premiership, but what the English First Division was, uh, I remember you know, in 1990, really understanding what the World Cup was for the first time, the U.S. qualified, obviously that was a, a factor in it, um, but also it was more available than it was in 1986, and I was, I was, I was pretty young then, um, and then by the end of that, that uh, 1990-91 World Cup cycle, you know, obviously having 
uh, having dad as an assistant coach as a goalkeeper coach with Anson and Lauren Gregg in, in China for that first victory. Um, you know, I always, uh, on several other podcasts and in, in situations like this, I've talked about how, um, you know, it would have been easy for people not to understand what was happening and, and the, the impact, um, but it wasn't lost on me. You know, at that point, um, we'd had the opportunity to be around the national team somewhat. Michelle Akers was a superstar from, you know, the moment, uh, you know, that I, I first mm-hmm. ever got to see her play. And, and uh, you know, those were fun days in, in soccer in the U.S. I remember being at a U.S. men's national team versus Juventus game at the Yale Bowl in New Haven. You know, it's hard to imagine some of the things that, that came out of that era uh, being able to happen, you know, happen today. But uh yeah, but we, you know, there was a wave. Soccer was was coming. The World Cup was coming. The Olympics were coming. MLS was coming, and and uh, you know, a lot of that childhood was was riding that wave. Right on, dude. Yeah, I mean, I was like I say, so I was born in '63, so I went through soccer in the '70s and that real low period. But I remember this wave and it really did feel like wave and it felt like wave after wave and you could feel it building and growing. And, uh, you know, I remember dreaming of someday you'll see soccer used as the prop on television, soccer ball, you know, kids in the park, someday you'll see that. And, you know, now of course we're here in the landscape and people don't understand how far we came from those, from those early days. Yeah, obviously I wasn't around for the NASL days, but uh, I I love um, rock and roll soccer, which is the the story of the NASL, um, and and understanding our history. I think there's a tremendous significance and importance to understanding the history of the game in this country. And you know, I was I was fortunate with uh, with my father being uh, you know in the circles that he was to you know to go to the convention and and uh, shake hands with guys like Walter Barr and, and Irv Schmidt and the, the Red Aprons, um, you know, to be able to to join him for breakfast with Shell Heinemann and, and guys of, of his generation. Uh, and also to, to have the opportunity to, you know, to meet and travel with uh, Mooch Meiernick and, and guys who have, who've, uh, you know, pre, uh, uh, you know, pre-deceased uh, even ahead of my father's time, but, you know, really, the the story of soccer in our country is is just the incredible uh, humans that have connected themselves to this game that have that have served the game uh, with an understanding that this was something much larger than themselves, um, you know, and and to to have a front row seat to it both at the the national team level but also at a much more uh, you know much smaller level at, at colleges and and uh, you know, clubs and, and state association levels and ODP. I mean, you know, it's a, obviously it's a complicated history, but it is, there's tremendous lessons for us to extract from it. And, and uh, you know, I think that his understanding of, of those who came before him was, was part of the, the reason I feel that, that way about, um, you know, the Charlotte Morans of the world who aren't here to see the NWSL, uh, you know, become what it is, but who was there at the beginning. Um, there's a, it's a long list. So. Yeah, that was one of the, you just mentioned the word lessons and the lessons that, that they can be brought out of it. And that was one of the questions that was floating around in my head here is I wonder what lessons Anthony has taken out of this that have really affected and molded his shape and, and, and shaped his life out of the experiences that he grew up with, because there's so many of them, right? Uh, experiences that you got to see, like you said, front row seat. Front row seat. Uh, there, there is, but I think probably the number one lesson is you, you, there's, there's an infinite number of lessons to extract from these situations and don't stop learning. I mean, you know, one of, um, one of the members of the, uh, the women's national team staff in 96 and 99 was, uh, was um, Pauline Hacker, Dr. Hacker, and she just put out this book uh, this past year. And, and I mean, I've, I've known Dr. Hacker for, you know, for 20 years now, and I'm still learning lessons from her. I'm still, uh, you know, listening uh, as, as well as I possibly can to, uh, to the experience of, of others, because 
you know, you can, you can put two players on the same trajectory. They can play on the same youth team, club team, uh, high school team, go to the same college and have dramatically different experiences. You know, the, the nature of our journey through soccer is that it's so multivariable that even though there are more well-trodden paths, you know, I think this is where you, you uh, do a fantastic job of, of kind of shining the light on, but everybody's journey is different. And I get asked all the time about, about not playing college soccer. And I, there was scenarios where I could have played college soccer, but they would have put me on very, uh, on a very different trajectory than, than the one I ended up on. And I'm grateful for the one I ended up on. Uh, I'm also grateful for having gotten to, to watch, you know, two of my brothers, you know, lead their teams. Uh, you know, my youngest brother was part of, of a, of a D3 team that, uh, that made the NCAA tournament for the first time. That was a massive accomplishment right. for them yeah. um, and, and something that, you know, that he'll, he'll cherish for, uh, you know, for the rest of his life. Also, his freshman year in college, he didn't play. He went and studied abroad in Madrid and played pickup soccer and, and in men's leagues. So, you know, there's, there's no way to, you know, to, I think, you know, say that, that this, is, this is the way that your journey through the game is going to go. Um, and in doing that, you know, you, you meet eclectic, uh, you know, and sometimes eccentric groups of people who uh, will see the game the way that you do, or maybe don't speak the same language that you do, but you both speak the language of soccer. And, and uh, you know, I'm incredibly uh, blessed. You know, I think that's probably one of the other big lessons from, you know, a childhood around the national team and in soccer uh, in that era is gratitude for what we do have. You know, there's, there's a thousand and one ways that if I could snap my fingers to make soccer better, I would, but I do that through a lens of gratitude for the journey that we've been on together and, and where soccer has taken us, because even though there's real horrible aspects of that journey that hopefully we don't have to go through again, um, they've also brought us incredible places as well. So I think that that, that contradiction is one that that's hard to reconcile, um, but we, we all have to because we love the game. Well, yeah, but I mean, isn't that life? As you get older and you start to realize, look, that's just, I've often said that if, if I had fallen in love with the violin, I would be trying to teach kids life lessons through use of the violin. Yep. That's what I would be trying to, it, my tool just happens to be the sport that saved my life, changed the direction of my life. And I watched it change the direction of other lives. And I said, yeah, this is a good one. I like this one. So we just happened to choose this vehicle, but that exactly well, you, what you, you said did. is you did. So I'm not spot. sure I had much, uh, much choice. This is uh, one of those situations <laughs> where soccer, soccer Born may have it. kind of chosen, chosen me. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe mine says the same thing. Cause my kid had a, Brad had a milder version of what you had growing up and he's about your age ish. And uh, I can understand how that is. And he's still coaching today. And uh, yeah, it was a little different for you. But that's kind of what I wanted to talk about a little bit. People to understand, A, where we've come from. And I think we've done a good job covering where it's going. You have your finger, I would say, as well as anybody on the pulse of the women's game, for sure. Uh, but you also are just a fan of, of the game in general. Um, so look, we, look, I would say it's much more, country's much more divided now than it was 20, 25 years ago. Would you agree as far as youth soccer goes? Look, more branches heading off more different directions than there used to be? Well, not just more branches, but but more trees, right? I mean, if we go back, you know, 25 or 30 years ago, you know, youth soccer was you know, USU soccer at that time, U, US, uh, YS now, and then obviously AYSO and say existed and they had their kind of, kind of niches to, to it. Um, but this isn't just US club soccer coming into, into the landscape and it's not just additional leagues forming and it's not just the ECNL. Uh, it's also US soccer's decision to go the route that they did with the, the DA, um, and then much later, the girls' DA. So, 
you know, there's, you know, there's a, um, you know, kind of a, a cornucopia of soccer options that families have to make these days. And, you know, I went from uh, being in the leadership of an ECNL club when the girls ECNL first launched to being very grateful not to be coaching at an ECNL or a GA or a DA or an MLS Next or, or any of those leagues because uh, it, it took a lot out of me. It was a hard, it was a hard uh, stretch for me as a coach. And so now I, I have a much more myopic view where I work with a, a community club that works to compete and develop players. And, you know, we'll certainly celebrate players when they, uh, when they go on to play, you know, ECNL or MLS next or any of these. Um, and then I coach the high school, the boys and girls programs here in town. And, you know, I think that what you're going to continue to see is, is soccer head in, in a, a dual path where, we are more community centric than we've been probably since the pre MLS days. And that's lower division soccer. That's the growth and, and maturity of, of youth clubs. It's a better understanding of what long-term success may look like, um, you know, which is more stable, robust clubs in more places and more towns and more communities across the country. Um, and that path is going to, uh, you know, be inhibited by the fact that we have more clubs who are continuing to grow larger and larger to support the business of soccer that, you know, MLS and, and money that uh, can influence, you know, massive shifts in uh, the professional ranks are going to continue to, to play a role. I mean, all we have to do is look at the PGA live news this week, uh, you know, to, to see what that can look like um, or, or Benzema going to, to Saudi Arabia. So we're going to continue to experience that here as well. Money is going to continue to be a major player and a major factor in decisions made for and around soccer. And, and that's going to be true at every level. Uh, we're going to see that at, at uh, U.S. soccer and, and as it relates to the World Cup. And we're going to see that uh, with the local youth club who's trying to start a youth three elite team or a premier team, right? Because, you know, parents, they, it kind of preys on parents' fear that if they don't, it, that they're going to miss the, they're going to miss the bus. They're going to miss the train and that it's the last train leaving the station. And we have a lot of evidence and a lot of data now that, that tells us that that's just not necessarily the, the reality of, of, um, you know, player development and what players experiences have to be. And, and, you know, I think that that message, uh, you know, on a on a local level, on a national level, on a regional level, has to be the unifying message, right? Which is, youth soccer can be better. We all have a role to play in making it better. And if we make it better, everybody's experience in the game, players, parents, referees, coaches, administrators, everyone's uh, experience in the game has the potential to improve. Um, and so it, it ultimately comes back to us taking responsibility and being accountable for the role that we play in shaping what the future of soccer in this country is going to look like. Yeah, you know, Anthony, we often forget uh, that when we talk about the, the initial leagues, right, the ones in the, and the kids pursuing college and all that, that at most, it might be 10% of all of the kids playing soccer in this country that we're talking about. The rest of yeah, them are playing. I think 10% is 10 a little high, right? Based on... Generous number. I'm being generous. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not even that, probably. You're right. So so when I hear that, and I, I one of my roles here uh, is I'm the college advisory program director for our small little community club. And, you know, it helps that, that I'm the high school coach as well. So, you know, I can kind of uh, you know, support those players in, in those dual roles. But uh, of our graduating senior class of, of uh, 12 seniors on the boys' side this year, we have three who are going on to play in college. And what I see in that scenario is not players who are ready to be done playing soccer. It's that we've created a structure. I and mean, everybody loves to talk about the pyramid. But one of the downsides of a pyramid is the higher you climb up the pyramid, the less opportunities exist in that space and right. so you know 
what I would like to see continue to evolve is uh, more robust uh, club soccer and adult soccer collaboration at the collegiate levels. I think that there's a massive opportunity there, you know? Absolutely. And I think if you did that and, and we invested in that, I think one of the things that would come out of that are more of the Jamie Vardy esque stories of guys who are, who are late bloomers, but find their way into a USL team or an MLS team, you know, later on in their, in their paths, because, you know, I think what we know from the pre MLS days is there was a lot of really good players who just didn't have a place to play. And, you know, who knows what their career is going to become. Yep. Absolutely. And college wasn't what it was now. You didn't have as many college teams back then. Right. Uh, So, yeah, no, that, that's a brilliant point. Uh, And I, and I, I, so what projects I noticed your, your shirt on there. uh, Soccer parenting association. Is that, is that uh, a project that you're working on? So I've been, uh, Sky Eddie is the founder and CEO of Soccer Parenting, uh, and she's been working on on it for just a, just about a decade now, I think uh, nine years now. And so last year I joined on a part-time basis where uh, I work with our partners across the country, including the Girls Academy, including, uh, you know, USU Soccer and, and uh, about 15 state associations, and then a whole bunch of leagues across the country. Uh, to to help guide this, you know, this, uh, you know, this evolved engagement and understanding of the role that parents can have in cultivating more positive environments, more positive sidelines, more supportive uh, interactions between um, themselves and their children. Uh, so it's, it is a labor of love for Sky that, uh, that continues to grow and continues to gain momentum. And so we have uh, we have nine staff members working on uh, soccer parenting and the sideline project uh, these days. So if I'm a parent or if I'm a coach and I go, this sounds interesting. How do I how do I find out more information? Yeah, the first thing I would say is is uh, visit the website, which is soccerparenting.com um, or uh, the sidelineproject.com. Uh, sideline project being specific and multi-sport approach to improving sideline behavior, um, both in, in support of players, but also as we're continuing to do more, we're, we're obviously uh, reinforcing the message that we need to, we need to be more mindful of our uh, behavior and approach towards referees. Um, you know, referees are a critical piece of our game and one, you know, an area that, that when I talk to, to uh, leaders across the country, everybody recognizes that the referee situation is unsustainable. So the only way that we are able to continue to evolve what we're doing and to create more trust between referees and coaches and players uh, and parents is to, to approach this problem with more empathy, with more kindness, with more civility, with more awareness, which starts with more self-awareness. Um, you know, and, and where, where there are uh, leaders who are reinforcing that message on a consistent basis, uh, and I see it with our state associations, it's not that there's no issues or that there's no problems, but we do, do see uh, improved sideline behavior, and we do see improved relationships between parents and their uh, sons and daughters once parents understand the implications of their behavior, uh, you know, on the sideline. I love that. What a worthy uh, effort to, to 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 put something into. I got I was lucky enough to do a podcast not too long ago on a panel with Sky Eddie, and she was talking a little bit about the project. And I I just wanted to draw people's attention to it because I think it's really important. Well, we appreciate uh, that, and there is a three day free pass uh, available for anyone through Soccer Parenting, but. The most cost-effective way and, and what we are working to do, we have over 200 club members across the country, but a club membership is only $500 for all of the members of the club. And so the opportunity for more club leaders and club directors to get on this bandwagon, because when I was growing up and even when I was a young coach, the approach towards parents was very much to keep them at arm's length. 
And I think whether we're talking about their journey through the game or the college recruiting process, one of the things that we've got to do is help parents to understand their role because they do have a role to play in all of this. They do have, have uh, you know, are, they are the beneficiaries of an education around all of these things that are happening in soccer. Um, and then through that education, you can make the right decision whether or not going to the ECNL is what's best for your player or whether or not, you know, staying in a situation where you've got a coach and, and uh, a, an environment where you're growing and learning might be the better path. Because I, I think this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is there isn't one path for everyone. And so the, the player that I'm thinking of specifically is a goalkeeper. So going the ECNL route would make him 100% a goalkeeper for that team versus an environment where he's developing as a goalkeeper, but also plays in the field some and is continuing to develop as a soccer player and, and grow his understanding of the game on a more uh, comprehensive manner. It, it comes down to that player, right? Every player is going to respond differently in those situations, but our ability as coaches, as leaders within the space to help parents to get their head around that question, to understand the implications of the decisions that they and their, their player make you know, to me, that's a, it was a critical void that was missing until Sky uh, kind of leaped headfirst into that deep end of the pool uh, to try and just give parents more tools, more resources, more education, uh, and, and a pathway towards better engagement um, so that we don't have, you know, quite so many parents who are, you know, who are, who are getting into referees or coaches or don't understand what it is that they're, that they're even asking, right? Um, they need to, they need to see the bigger picture. So that's where we're trying to help. What a uh, couple, couple college, I want to just a little shift here into talking about college just a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, cause I know you help a lot of kids. You've helped a lot of kids. You've been part at somewhere of a lot of different journeys. Uh, and, and so I think that authorizes you to speak out as, as and I expert. take a lot of pride in that as well, because, you know, right. one of the best things we can do as a coach is, is put our ego aside and help our player to find the right environment for them, even if it's not what you think the right environment for them is, right? And, right. you know, having been on both sides of it as a, as a, a club coach, as a high school coach, uh, you know, as a camp director, and then having having worked with players at the division three and division one levels uh, at various stints, you know, in, in my journey uh, you know, there's, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings and misinformation about what the college experience is. And I think the more we can pull back that curtain um, not to the, you know, the glitz and glamor of the college experience, but the reality of the college experience, the, the, the ups and the downs, the good and the bad, um, you know, then I think we're, we're helping players to find the right place for them. Yeah. And maybe, as you said, in this, maybe it's not playing in college per se, maybe it's playing on the club team, or like you said, maybe the local adult team, maybe it gives that perfect blend of that experience. And usually with our clients, that's the question I start with is me trying to understand what experience they are seeking. Mm -hmm. that they are picturing, that they are wanting, and combining that with an end goal, right? I live in, I live in gold country, so it always amazes me that in 1849 and 1850, all these people picked up from Missouri, and they made their treacherous way out west. There, were no, there was no Route 66. They had to make their way across dangerous territory. But somebody said, look, here's the end goal, Here's the safest path to get there. You can go that way, but here's the risks. You can go that way, but there's the risks. And so I often look at my job as that and our jobs as coaches that are choosing to mentor and lead players as that, helping them understand the possible risks to each one, and then they get to make their choice. Well, and, and hopefully I it's the right one. Yeah, well, and I look at, at a lot of situations, uh, you know, I look at a lot of situations like the one I was just talking about with, with the ECNL and the, and the, uh, the state league as win-win, 
right? That's the scenario that you want to find yourself in is that there's no bad choices here. Yes, there's a choice and it may feel massive in that moment. But if you if you've done this right, you're you're not it's not between the, the correct choice and the wrong choice. It's just a preference or a gut feeling or a, a pull or any number of of you know differentiators that maybe exist for for different um you know for different players and different families well i would say start with the series of tick boxes what things are most important to you start figuring out and at the end of the day you're not sure why you fell in love you just did it feels different than the other ones i think I if think you so. can like that. at least get it narrowed down to that piece of of who wants you i don't know why i that relationship felt different i don't know why and that i think that gets ignored sometimes for favor of oh this is more glamorous this will get me more you know that this fits more the narrative that had been being woven all those years that's why i like well, the erica I, sutter story I, I, yeah because she made a choice to go to johns hopkins she had d1 choices legitimate ones and she was one of the better players being recruited she made a choice and i just i love that well and i think i think what you're what you're on to is is really uh critical there which is we have to be really mindful of the stories we're telling ourselves and i say that to both players and also to parents because it's not that you shouldn't write an epic story and it's not that, that you shouldn't you know dream about winning a national championship or whatever that may look like um, but you just have to be really mindful of, of the story you're telling yourself, because when you started telling yourself that story, you had different information than you do now. And you've probably felt differently about various aspects of your life than you do now. So the permission to change the story or to end that, that story and start writing a new story, I think is really important. And I think that works both ways too. One of the things I, I think about a lot, um, you know, Erica's is a, is a great example. Another uh, example that kind of works in, in reverse of that is uh, Adelaide Gay's story about transferring from Yale to UNC and having Anson tell her, don't come here. You know, I don't, I don't see that you're going to play here. You know, this may not be the right decision. And at the time I remember feeling the, the same, which is it's a, it's a big you know, trade to give up Yale for the possibility at UNC. Right. And, and then you follow that story to its conclusion. And she not only wins a national championship there and, and wins the, the starting job and does all the things that, that other people questioned she would be able to do. Um, but she had the experience that she wanted to have. She, she lived her dreams and is still living her dreams as a professional player. So I think it's, it's okay for you know us as coaches us as parents to have opinions um and i think it's also okay for uh players to take that leap of faith and and do what they feel called to do in spite of the odds being against them in spite of you know only being you know somewhere less than 10% or or less than 2% or whatever whatever the statistics say you know i i do think that it's it's okay for you to to take those leaps of faith and even if they don't work out, you know, having the opportunity to extract lessons from there and, and uh, you know, find a different path. And I, I know this is a big talking point for you right now is the transfer portal, right? I mean, I don't know what the most recent number is. I was going to ask you what you, I was going to ask you what you thought. See, my, my, I've changed my mind on the transfer portal every six months as I think about, well, this is, uh, but, uh, you know, one of the issues we have with the transfer portal right now, Anthony, is that. For the most part, the kids that are in the portal talking about transferring were COVID admittance kids. They never got to meet the coaches, really. They never got to see the schools. These were 20. This is the class of 20 and 21, for the most part, that's leaving a year or two later. And yep. they were COVID kids. Now, does that affect the numbers? It has to, to some extent. How much? I have no idea how much. I know it's growing and doubling, and it's, the size is unbelievable. But I kind of might expect that during the circumstances to which these kids committed to their schools. Yeah, I what think we that's think part was going to happen. Uh, you know, after 9 11, I remember seeing uh, admissions 
uh, and having coaches tell me that that applicants from in state or much closer to their schools were dramatically up and admittances or acceptances or applications from uh, you know from students who were much further away were way down you know and and there was there's some psychology to understand that you know parents probably wanted their kids a little closer kids probably wanted to be a little bit closer um, COVID potentially had a little bit of the opposite effect which is they spent all this time at home. And the restrictions get lessened. And now there's just this desire to spread your wings. And maybe, you know, some people, you know, spread a little bit further than they were comfortable with. And that, that's okay. Right. You learn something from that process. But I think probably as big or a bigger factor coming off of COVID is the economic impact of college athletics. And the fact that we've seen roster sizes, particularly at the Division One level, growing because there are more student athletes than than scholarships and schools understand that, you know, having those students as part of the athletics program is filling a, you know, their ability to either maintain their, their levels at a school, or in many cases, we're seeing uh, schools increase their enrollment, you know, as things become more competitive, they can accept more students. They can, you know, they can grow their, uh, the size of their, of their, um, you know, campus population. So I think that that's a factor uh, in there as well. I think that's a factor. And I do think that the other factor is, I'm pretty sure that we've got kids that are playing college soccer for a year or two out of some warped sense of obligation for, to this payback for all the money, time, effort that was spent in travel. I know that's happening. I just don't know what the numbers are. I've talked to kids that that's what's happening. And then, you know, this obsession with if I don't play you when I'm a failure, you know, that, that internal voice that thinks talking to a lot of kids where it needs to be day one. It needs to be, needs to be, as if it's all the same, A, but either regardless. That negates all of the other things that you and I have talked about, about what makes, you know, the right fit for a person. I was just listening to the the Snacks podcast and Christy Mewis talking about, if I don't make this World Cup team, is my career a failure? You know, and she goes on to talk about how, you know, it's not like she walked away from, from college and had, you know, multiple national championships or you know, she was part of the Houston team that wins the college cup or the uh, challenge cup uh, in 2020, but it's not like they, you know, have, have lifted multiple NWSL trophies or anything like that. And I think that this is, this is part of the reconciliation that the players and parents have to go through is yes, we hold up, uh, you know, title winning, you know, teams and athletes. And that is part of the nature of sports in, in the U S and and I've seen that firsthand with the way that we, uh, you know, the way that we as a soccer community have responded to, uh, you know, the U.S. Women's National Team winning World Cups and and the U20s when my father was the coach, uh, winning that World Championship and also the narrative around our men's team. Um, and I, I think that it really is a symptom of the impact that we have. Uh, define success in the manner that we have, right? All of this stems from redefining what winning and what success is. And if you're playing college soccer, that's success at any level. That's, that is a victory of, of sorts. Now, it you're may not be the victory that, yeah. you know, that you initially were, were in pursuit of, but, you know, I, I told you two of my brothers played college soccer. One played division one, in the Pac-12, which in the Pac-12, I don't know if, if your listeners know, but I don't know how it's going to get reshaped with with uh, UCLA leaving. But there was only five Pac-12 members and then San Diego State as an associate member. So you have six teams in one of the most competitive uh, conferences that we had in men's soccer up until this year, um, where multiple years, four of the six teams were making the NCAA tournament. You know, we're going on deep runs. Um, and we had, we had my other brother who played for a D3 program in Boston. Like I said, went and did his freshman year abroad, came back, joined that program. And, and ultimately they won their, 
you know, their uh, league title one of the three years. And, and that meant they got a ticket to the NCAA tournament where they got uh, soundly uh, beaten up by a NESCAC school that's a perennial, you know, top five program. So is that success? Well, yeah, of course it is. It, you know, we would be silly not to view that as success. Um, but also success for them is different than, you know, success for Indiana or success for, you know, Carolina and some of these, some of these larger schools. That's okay. You know, I, I think, I think the, the part where a lot of players, um, you know, kind of mm -hmm. get diverged from the path that they will enjoy the most is mm -hmm. when it comes back to what's your role on the team going to be, you know, because mm. I think a lot of players go to places where they fight for three years to then either play or, or two years to then either play or not play. Right. But it's years at the division one level, it's years of work to just put yourself into the situation where you're going to have a role or you're not going to have a role. And this, we're not talking about the youth national team players or the, you know, the, the top 10 recruits right. in the country. But, you know, if you are a division one caliber player who's looking to go to an ACC or a big 10 or a, you know, PAC 12 school, mm -hmm. are you going to love the process enough to make up for not getting to play a whole lot of minutes or maybe even being asked to red shirts? for years of your college experience or you just want to compete for a starting job and put yourself in a position where you're going to have a, an outsized role on whatever team that you join. And I don't think there's a correct answer to that, but I do think that the way it's framed for a lot, a lot of, of players, players. And, and families, that's not the question that's posed, right? the role and the understanding of, of where you fit in to the hierarchy is not really a big enough part of the conversation. So then you end up in a situation where you're almost guaranteed adversity, right? And you're going to learn a lot about yourself from those situations, but also from, and I'd be curious to, to know if you've had similar experiences from my situation it's okay to embrace the pain and embrace disappointment and use failure as fertilizer. I also don't think you have to put yourself in a disadvantageous position because I think everywhere you go in life, you're going to face adversity. So putting yourself as far behind the eight ball as you can to prove to yourself, I guess that you can, that you can get yourself out of that situation. I think that happens too much. Well, look, if I decide to start mountain climbing, the first one I'm not going to climb is going to be Everest. I'm not, I'm not going to make my very first outing of ever climbing a mountain, Mount Everest. That would be stupid. You know, why don't I try to go walk up Spanish Peak over here first and see how that goes? And then I can take on this little one and that. And then maybe if I make it to Shasta, then we can start talking about the next one. But I look at it the same way. These, these kids don't understand that I'm the second or third best player, one of the two or three stars on my pretty good level team, but not the best team. And I'm going to go jump in with international players who have been representing their country playing in front of tens of thousands of people with all of this experience, and I'm going to beat them out. It's not that it's not possible. Of course it's possible. What are the odds? What are the odds? And the more... The higher level you go, the, the more the odds are stacked against you. And again, not that you shouldn't take on that challenge. I have a young lady who went from Ohio, never played any of the high-level teams, went to a mid-level D1, and we ended up transferring her back to a D3 in Ohio. And in her words, the mountain was just too high. The mountain is just, I tried and the mountain is too high, in her words. Uh, I, well, it shows a tremendous amount of self self realization, self awareness oh, on her oh, part. Just love it. Yes. You know what I what I Maturity. would say to a player who came to me with that decision is, this may feel like a disappointment, but but my confidence that you are going to be successful in life 
has just skyrocketed because the emotional <laughs> intelligence yes. of, of, a, of a young man or young woman to make that decision, yeah. you know, that's pretty rare. No. And I think that's, that's like, that's one of the markers of success of a coach, of a mentor, of somebody working with somebody. It's one of the measures of success. It's like, no, I'm feeling pretty good about this person's future right. and how they're going. And, and that adversity is what created that. You know, it gave her that opportunity at least to conquer it now in life rather than delay it to some point. She's blessed. She got to she got to experience it. Well, I think, and I in, think there's a lot of kids culture. in this country. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Perfect. Perfect. Segue. I was just going to say in, in, you know, in uh, in our culture where grind culture, hustle culture, you know, outwork everybody culture is so prevalent and it's. I mean, it's everywhere that you, you turn, you know, you don't have to even be following the accounts for it to pop up on Instagram or your Twitter feed or, or Snapchat right. or whatever, whatever platform you're on. And it's not that there is not validity to hard work. You and I both know that no one accomplishes any, any dream that they set out to accomplish without that being a core tenant is you're going to have to work hard. I think that the areas that I have become better as a coach are helping players to understand the true consequences of not working smart, of not allowing your body the time it needs to recover, of not properly, you know, hydrating, fueling, uh, challenging your body at, at that incremental steps, and also the value and the importance of surrender you know, surrendering the stories that don't serve you anymore, surrendering to the uh, realization that what got me to this point is not what's going to get me from this point to that next plateau, to that next level, to that next mountain peak as, as uh, you know, we think back to the analogy that you were giving them a little while ago. I have to continue to evolve. I have to continue to be a better version of myself as as a player, as a student of the game, as a, as a leader, then, then I had to be to get to, to this stage. And it's why I tell players all the time, you know, I think that when we evaluate players for, you know, collegiate level, I just got sent a video of a, a player who wants to, you know, be looked at by our youth national team coaches. And, and I think one of the, the things that we don't stress enough is just the importance of that consistency, right? The consistency to to show up and do oh, your absolutely. best. Absolutely, yeah. you know, yeah. and and that doesn't mean showing up to do the work for six hours, but but put a solid ninety minutes in at a high level, and you will achieve more than doing three sessions a day at the level that you you were at a year ago. Right? I'm working harder. I'm working harder. Well, you're working more. Right? You're working. You're, you're working. There's no doubt about that. But can you create that focused, conscious attention on the work that you do to be able to sustain that for longer durations? And I also think that's the difference between a player who's a 20 minute player at the division one level, uh, you know, versus a player who's a, a 90 minute player or a 110 minute player at the division one level, right? Is can you sustain that level of consistency over the duration of a game, over the duration of your training session, over the duration of your season. And if you can do that, then you, you start to find yourself at higher levels, whether or not that was your intention or not, right? You're just taking your game into these new stratospheres. Well, And that's all it is. And it, something hit me a few months ago. It really did smack me in the face when I was thinking about this consistency issue. And the question was, who do coaches trust or who do coaches play, play coaches play players they trust? Well, what does that mean? It means players that consistently perform. Well, isn't that every human being that we deal with in our lives? Who do we enjoy hanging out with the most? Who do we enjoy doing projects with the most? The guy who shows up at 10 o'clock when he's supposed to show up at seven, then shows up at seven and says, look at me, I was on time, then shows up at nine, then doesn't do this, then doesn't do that. Then he does three great things in a row, but then he's back to this and back to that. Like, I'm exhausted, man. I'm just well, and exhausted. I think, I think and what, 
yeah, what you're saying though is is critical because consistent players are also accountable players. Yeah, and they understand the right reasons why to be accountable too. It's not just, oh, it's all my fault, it's all my fault. That's not what we mean by accountability. It's understanding the totality of the situation and understanding why it broke down and why it worked well and understanding that I am part of this team, therefore part of the solution, therefore part of the problem at all times. Yeah. What am I doing to minimize the chances that somebody in our rowboat around and is rowing the other direction? <laughs> what, what am I doing to make sure that we're always pulling in the right direction together as a team in unison as much as possible? We're always on the same page, emotionally, mentally, physically, as much as possible. Am I helping or am I hurting? Yeah, Colleen, uh, I was talking about Dr. Hacker earlier, and it was definitely as the team, as the women's national team got closer to, uh, you know, major events, the Olympics, the World Cup, she would say, you know, everything that happens today, everything that happens this week, everything that happens in this last month is either going into the pile of things that are going to help us to see our vision, our shared vision realized, or they hurt us. And I think that the real challenge that you know, or they're neutral. They can be neutral. There is a neutral where you're not helping or hurting, in which case, though, you're still taking up space to somebody yeah, who's I'm not, not pulling I'm up. I'm not sure in that. Yes, I think that there are. I think that, that when you look at those types of analogies, you can look at things as being without judgment. It's okay to eat some ice cream on Sunday because you were at a picnic and there was ice cream and you like ice cream. That's not necessarily going to go into your helping category, but it's also it's balanced out because in the helping category, you're enjoying yourself. You're enjoying your social connections. You're you're having fun, which I think does put players in the, in the right headspace in order to perform. So I don't think that anything, right. you know, can be distilled down to necessarily the cliches that we use or the the um, you know common parlance that we become accustomed to because when you do talk about this for as long as you have and as long as I have I think you know we do have to find ways to distill things down to be more manageable for players and parents to to understand but I I, I don't think that that anybody should be afraid of delving into the complexities or the multifaceted equation that is performance and I think People have demonstrated different ways to unlock their optimal performance. Um, and I think that unless you are, number one, your authentic self, and number two, willing to go on that intrinsic journey of what drives you, what motivates you, what's my why, how am I going to be more consistent, right. what's my leadership style, right. that, that you never end up fully appreciating the the. Uh, totality of the of what your journey had to offer you um so I, I i mean we've been talking for a while now and we could we could talk for another three days about it because it is no that's that is the dude that i think that's a perfect wrap-up look it's this idea that no matter what else is around you man and no matter who you're surrounded by all of that at the end of the day this is your journey man do what you want to do life is too short do follow the path you want to pat you want to follow uh i would love to just continue to be able to have us as adults empower kids to be able to speak up to their family members and their coaches and their and their people around them go no this is my pathway i don't well, have to and be... I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll just throw this out there as well is that the the fear that prevents players from authentically following their path and some of it's intrinsic fear, some of it's extrinsic fear, uh, you know, the parents feel. Um, but I, I think if we could, if we could reveal one thing to parents that, and, and players that maybe they're not thinking about currently is that a lot of the fear that you will encounter is perceived fear. It's perceived fear of choosing the wrong college. It's perceived fear of the path that you didn't take. Right. So, it, yes, you do have to face your fear at times. You do have to be uncomfortable. But more than that is you've got to recognize fear from the illusion of fear, that perceived fear that I think paralyzes far too many people and has has had massive 
uh, impacts on my journey as well, because I couldn't see the difference for a long time. Um, and it held me back from, from, uh, from not better, not worse, but certainly different experiences. Well, yeah, I think it's the old Mark Twain quote, or I'm going to bastardize it, I'm going to screw it up. But uh, most of the horrible things in my life, some of them actually happened. <laughs> All these imagined fears. I think we can leave it on that one, brother. Hey, I really appreciate you coming on board with us. Where can people find, do you have any other projects going on besides uh, soccer parent uh, parenting and what else can, pe can you point people to? Yeah, I, the easiest... Uh place if people are, are looking for me is uh, at the Chico method on uh, Twitter. Um, I'm on there less than I used to be, but I am still on there. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a whole lot of various projects, the grassroots symposium for USU soccer, and obviously what we're doing with soccer parenting in the club and, and, uh, and soccer here, uh, here in Utah. But uh, but I'll continue to pontificate and, and uh, have conversations about soccer at all levels, because uh, at the end of the day, I, I think, you know, it is um, incredibly important for us to recognize the reason that we are on the journey that we're on is because we opt in, you know, every time that we connect right. ourselves deeper to the game, we invest ourselves in the game, we opt into this. And, and um, you know, the way I feel is that, uh, you know, I was making a joke earlier about whether or not I chose this path, but I obviously did. Um, and I also have tremendous gratitude for it. And for all of the people uh, that that uh, soccer has brought to, you know, my consciousness and my awareness, and, and that includes you, Don. So I appreciate the invitation to be on today and I uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon, man.